Welcome to this presentation relating to disability discrimination. We're going to do about the first half of the material in this um, presentation in this particular lecture. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> We're going to cover several different topics and we'll basically be covering um, this column here, this, this column in our first lecture. We're going to do a very short introduction. Then we're going to discuss the prima facie framework for ADA claims and you'll see that it is very, very similar to the prima facie framework that we've used in our Title VII uh, situations. There's a couple of tweaks though that I do want to draw your attention to. And then we'll talk about some key concepts. Um, after we complete the key the key concepts in this lecture, we'll see that the reasonable accommodation topic, which really is also going to tie very closely to the undue hardship topic, both of these are going to roll over into our next section. Uh, so we'll kind of end on reasonable accommodation, then our next lecture will begin on reasonable accommodation. Because honestly, that's where the activity is in this topic. We're going to talk about a lot of other stuff, but really and truly, 90% of the litigation and 90% of the problems that HR uh, professionals have are going to be in this sweet spot where, where we see the, uh, the, the case all develop and be of particular interest. And in our second presentation, we'll cover our second column. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to cover a bit of the history of disability discrimination. I want to spend a lot of time on this because honestly, who cares about the history? We care about what's happening now. But actually, in this one area, it is kind of useful to talk a little bit about the history because the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which was passed in 1990, um, is really the second discrimination statute that we had. Um, you really don't need to know very much about the first one. The first one is called the Rehabilitation Act, and as we can see, it was passed in 1973. So this was passed just after we had all of the activity in the 60s with uh, Title VII and American uh, Age Discrimination Employment Act and the Equal Pay Act and all that stuff. All that activity, this came at the tail end of it, but it was very restricted. It provided pretty much the same goodies to disabled individuals individuals um, as the Americans with Disabilities Act provides, except it was limited to people who work for the federal government and a few other folks. Uh, so the, the, the scope of the benefits were about the same as what we see under the Americans with Disabilities Act, but it was limited to federal employment. You might almost call it kind of a dry run, a test. Hey, how much of a problem is this going to be? How awesome is it going to be? Let's do some almost test marketing, you could say, to see if this is really, really going to work. And the uh, judgment that our Congress made was that, yes, it does work. And so it was expanded um, about 17 years later in 1990 to cover pretty much the entire U.S. economy. So you may say, mm, that's maybe interesting, but how does it impact me? Well, it impacts you in this sense. As you dive into this practice area, uh, you will see that many of the cases that we, we struggle with in this area are going to be Rehabilitation Act cases. And in the vast majority of cases, uh, um, the ADA just uses the Disability Act, excuse me, the, the uh, Rehabilitation Act cases. So don't be taken aback when you're reading a case in this area um, and see, oh, well, gosh, they're interpreting the Rehabilitation Act. That's not the statute that applies in my fact pattern. I care about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, just know that for the most part, Rehabilitation Act equals Americans with Disabilities Act in terms of statutory interpretation. Okay, so that's pretty much all you need to know about the Rehabilitation Act. Um, the ADA does require an EEOC charge. We're not really going to spend it really any time on this topic um, because the EEOC process works exactly the same for the Americans with Disabilities Act as it works for uh, Title VII type situations. You're going to have the charge file. There's going to be that uh, likely that mediation process. The EEOC is going to investigate it and will likely issue a right to sue letter. The charging party has then 90 days to file a lawsuit if the charging party wants to. Same process that we have under the ADA as we have under Title VII. And let's talk about the two titles in the ADA. Um, 
the title that we care about in this class, and by the way, title is just basically section um, of a particular statute. Um, so title one of the Americans with Disabilities Act has to do with employment. Title two has to do with public accommodation. Um, for example, let's say I'm in a wheelchair and I want to see the Cowboys play um, in, in, uh, in uh, Irving, I guess, um, in, in, in the stadium. Um, and I, I find when I get there that I can't get my wheelchair to where my seats are. Well, that would be a Title II violation and um, because I'm a, have a right to have access to any places that the general public has access, um, even though I am in a wheelchair or perhaps have some other type of issue. This is one of the reasons, for example, why, why businesses can't refuse to permit people who have service animals to use those service animals as they shop or eat or whatever. Um, title II does not have to do with employment. So when we're talking about Title II, we're talking about the general public. We're not talking about um, employees or applicants or anything like that. Um, many times HR professionals have to deal with Title II issues if they happen to have an employment uh, situations where the general public is interacting. For example, if you are in a retail store environment, well, you have to make sure that your aisles have a certain width so that people who are in wheelchair, wheelchairs will be able to maneuver down those aisles. There are also fire code issues in play there. And so you have to be aware, well, well that's a Title II issue or that's a Title I issue. But for the purposes of this class, the only thing we're gonna focus on is Title I. And I guess another area where Title II comes up is for access students here at Collin. Um, when you take a course here, let's say you have a disability, for example, let's say that you have um, dyslexia, and so you need additional time to take tests because uh, the way that you read, it, you, the way your brain organizes the written words is a little different than the way uh, that a typical person uh, experiences reading. And therefore, perhaps that process takes a little bit more time for you. And so the way that we accommodate under Title II is through our access office and that may mean that you receive extra time or that perhaps you have a reader read the questions or something along those lines anyway so uh, title two also relates to um, accommodations in the um, educational uh, scenario beyond just the uh, physical access okay but now again we're going to go back to title one and focus on that okay so let's kind of get our big toe in the water with the language. We're going to spend a lot more time later on this presentation with this, but let's kind of play around with this for a second. In order to be covered by Title I of the ADA, you have to be a qualified person. You probably hear that term and go, ah, Groover, you're using language I know, because that's what we talked about when we were talking about the prima facie case. That's one of those four prongs. Well, you, if you caught on to that, you are doing great, because that is absolutely a requirement under Title VII. It's a requirement under the uh, Age Discrimination Employment Act. And yet again, we see it under the Americans Disabilities Act. Qualified is an important concept in employment discrimination generally. The person has to be qualified. If I'm not, qual if, you know, if I haven't gone to medical school and I apply to for that brain surgeon position, and I say, oh, I wasn't considered because I'm in a wheelchair. Well, the hospital is going to say, uh, Gruber, you need to go to medical school first. Once you get your educational credentials and the experience that you need for that, then come back and see us because then you will be qualified and then we'll engage in a conversation about this. But now you don't even have the basics. And so we need to have that first before we even look and see if there's a disability discrimination argument. So this is the definition. A qualified person with a disability means the individual satisfies the skill, experience, education, and other job-related requirements for the position with or without reasonable accommodation. Now you're probably on board, or I'm hoping you're on board up until this point. When we get to this point, um, um, we need to flip on over to a reason, uh, reasonable accommodation. Um, and so uh, we uh, need to kind of play around with that language and see kind of how that's going to play out. Um, reasonable accommodation means that, um, well, actually, it's, it's a rather complicated term, and we're going to be talking about it extensively later on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of pause on that term, and we'll return to it later on. But just know that qualified means exactly what you think it means up until this point. And then when we get to reasonable accommodation, we'll get more granular and figure out how these terms impact reasonable accommodation. Excuse me, re, well, uh, impacts qualification. 
So in addition to examining whether a person is a qualified person with a disability, we also have to consider, well, whether the employer is in some sense qualified. What employers are covered by this? You know, I already said that under the Rehabilitation Act, we were really just talking about the federal government and federal contractors. So it's a pretty small universe. But uh, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the universe became huge. I mean, virtually everybody who isn't a tiny, tiny employer is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in fact, we see we have the same employment horizon under ADA as we have under Title VII. I'm going to break away right here for a second and I'm going to go into some statutes. We haven't done a lot with statutes. Um, I apologize for not doing this earlier because this is super helpful, super, super awesome stuff to do. Um, here we go. So here we have stuff. This is the actual statute. You can see Americans with Disabilities Act of 1991, 1990 as amended. We'll see there were some significant amendments in 2008. We'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. So this is the latest and greatest format. It has the original stuff that wasn't changed. And then it's got all the cool stuff that we added in 2008. So I'm going to scroll down here. I'm going to go down to, I guess how does that going to go? Here we go. under additional definitions. Ah, yeah, so here we have the definition of the employer. You know, I throw around things all the time and I say, this is, this is what the statute means. And most students are very trusting and they just accept, oh, well, Gruber said that's what the statute means. It must be what the statute means. But um, every now and again, I'll have a student who's a little bit more skeptical, which is awesome because it means you're thinking hard, you're considering this, you want to see the language. You don't, you're not satisfied just because I said that that's what it says. And so for those amongst you who are skeptics or who want the deeper dive or who want the greater level of understanding, here we go. This is in fact the language that tells us whether someone is an employer or not. Employer in general. The term employer means a person you may pop, stop here and say, wait a second, gosh, uh, my employer is Exxon or my employer is um, Toyota or whatever. That's not a person. That's a company. Well, the term person in the law includes um, entities that aren't human beings. It includes legal entities like corporations, like partnerships. So don't, don't stumble over the word person in this context. It really means a human being or a business. So the term Lawyer, excuse me, the term employer means a person engaged in industry affecting commerce and industry affecting commerce. We'll talk about that in just a second. So pause on that or put a little asterisk there. Now we're going to get to the next section. The term employ, employer means a person engaged in, in an industry affecting commerce who has 15 or more employees. I didn't lie, right? But you can see. I rem I, while I didn't lie, I simplified it greatly. So now I'm going to show you the real definition. This is the unvarnished, complete deal. Okay, so this is the part that I, I usually edit out, but I, in, the, in the interest of full disclosure, so you get that this is more complicated than sometimes I make it seem. Um, let's go back and start this from the beginning. The term employer means a person engaged in an industry affecting commerce who has 15 or more employees for each working day in each of 20 or more calendar weeks in the current or preceding calendar year, and any agent of such person, except that for two years following the effective date of this subchapter, an employer means a person engaged in industry affecting commerce who has 25 or more employees for each working day in each of the 20 or more calendar weeks in the current or preceding year, and any agent of such person. Well, of course, we're not in 1991 or 1992, so this exception here is no longer applicable. And you can see that the 15 or more employees is actually kind of more complicated than that because we have to technically look back 20 more week or 20 or more calendar weeks, either in this year or last year, to do the counting. So a particular employer might have less than 15 employees. And yet if they have had more for at least 20 weeks, then they may still satisfy this definition. So when I say 20 or more employees, 
that's just the Cliff Notes version. There's a lot more complexity sentence to the issue. But you know what? If you've got 100 employees, you don't need to sweat this because you know you're well over 15. So um, only in the, the companies that are close to the line are you going to be interested in that. I'm also going to drill down a little bit on this qualified employee, individual, just so you can see what the statute's doing in this area. So we're going to go back up to the top and we're going to look at qualification standards. So we're going to go to defenses qualification standards. Ah, well, well, well actually, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. We'll, we'll, we'll visit that in a couple minutes. Okay, or actually in the next lecture. Okay, so that's where we are with this. So I wanted to just show you when I say 15 or more employees, we mean something a little bit more subtle than that. And now we have this language, oops, sorry about that. We have this language that I said to put a little asterisk by, industry affecting interstate commerce. Gosh, interstate commerce, what's that about? A little bit of constitutional law I'm gonna sprinkle in here. Um, when the Congress acts, the Congress, of course, is the federal government. Whenever the Congress acts, it needs to point to an enumerated power in the Constitution that gives it the authority to act. Um, so it has great power, but its power is limited to particular categories. So where it's powerful, it's really powerful. But when the, the Constitution has not given Congress to act in a particular area, Congress is powerless. It is impotent, so it's either highly potent or impotent. And so in that context, the, uh, the Congress is, is uh, having to tell us, or, or a well-written statute will have it tell the public, hey, this is why and how we have the authority to do this. And so that language was really a signal to legal professionals, yeah, we know we don't have infinite power. We're the Congress. We're super powerful where we're powerful, but we know it's not infinite. And so this is us limiting ourselves to where we're supposed to be. And we can only affect interstate commerce. That's in the, con that's in the Constitution. That's why, let me put it this way. That's one of the areas we have the power to affect interstate commerce. And so we're going to restrict ourselves to interstate commerce. Um, it's possible we might have authority beyond interstate commerce uh, if we're maybe alleging taxing power or some other type of power. But what we think our basis for authority to act in this way is the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. And so that's why we say industry affecting interstate commerce. You may think, well, what does that mean? Well, what it basically, it basically means everybody. There's almost or there's very, very few industries that are not engaged in interstate commerce. Imagine for a second that you happen to employ, we'll say 16 employees. You've got a lawn service. And uh, everybody who works for your business lives in Collin County. And all the lawns that you're mowing are in Collin County. Uh, you're a Texas-based corporation. Or maybe you're not even a corporation. Maybe you're sole proprietorship. Um, you think to yourself, well, gosh, I don't see how I'm interstate commerce at all. Except that you bought these lawnmowers from Home Depot. And guess what? You buy gasoline for your um, uh, uh, vehicles, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, or you're for your motors, you're for your uh, lawnmowers. And many times those things were part of interstate commerce. Oh, and you accept checks from your customers. And many times those checks are written in, from banks that are in different states. And um, when you need service on your lawnmower and you take it in maybe to get the blade sharpened or to get some repair work done, maybe new spark plugs or something, you um, go to a shop that is actually uh, incorporated in a different state. And you, you might say to yourself, well, yeah, but those are kind of details. You don't need a lot. You do not need a lot under the Constitution to be considered to be engaged in interstate commerce. So almost certainly, if a business has 15 employees, it's going to be involved in interstate commerce. If it's super small, maybe not. But usually once you get to 15, there's going to be sufficient interstate e-commerce that you're going to find that, yeah, that's a, 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 a not a hurdle that you have to worry about crossing. Okay, so let's continue on. So we've kind of played around with our definitions here. We know 
from the statute what we mean by the term employer now. Okay. There are some areas that are exempt from the ADA. One is the U.S. government. Gee, I wonder why they're exempt. Because of that Rehabilitation Act, right? Indian tribes are exempt. Probably the reason that they're exempt is that they really are, in many senses, autonomous nations within the country. Just like uh, the U.S. government doesn't pretend to tell Canada what to do, uh, or Mexico what to do, or France what to do, it's not usually going to be telling um, Indian tribes, Indian nations what to do. And then also another exception that we see in many statutes is the bona fide private membership club exception. Um, and so uh, that, again, but these other than the federal government, these are relatively small populations. Okay, so we have our first list. We're, we're, we're gonna see three lists that I've put into blue, and I like to call this the three by threes. This is our first three. And we see that the ADA requires reasonable accommodation in three aspects of employment. So we haven't really talked about reasonable accommodation yet, but I'm gonna start the conversation right here. So when we accommodate someone, we discuss this in the context of religious discrimination, when we, when we accommodate somebody, we're giving them something extra that we don't give to other people. Um, so let's imagine that um, I am vision impaired. I'm not blind, but I'm vision impaired. And so I need to really blow up the font on my computer so I can read what's on the computer. And the nature of the job that I'm seeking is one that I'm going to have to be able to use a computer. As a result, I may well need a much bigger monitor just to be able to see a meaningful amount of the material. And that monitor is going to cost, we'll say, $4,000. The traditional monitor that this particular workplace uses, uh, the monitors are $400. And so it's a pretty significant higher price. Um, the, my cubicle mate has typical vision. He needs the $400 monitor. Because of my vision, I need the $4,000 monitor. You can see how that would be an accommodation. Now, once I get the $4,000 dollar monitor, my, my cubicle mate might say, gosh, I'd love to have that. That would be so much fun. It'd be easier to see everything. It'd be super cool. And it might well be super cool for him to have that. But he isn't going to be able to require that the employer provide that um, because he doesn't have the disability that I have. Let's say that he's in a wheelchair. Um, he doesn't have a vision problem. And so he's on top to the $4,000 monitor but he might be entitled to having a, a larger space around his desk so he can maneuver. So maybe his half of our cubicle is significantly larger than my half. I think to myself, I would love to have more real estate to kind of be able to spread out more. But again, I don't have a mobility limitation, so I'm not entitled to that type of reasonable accommodation. So what would be a reasonable accommodation for one disability or one employee might be very different from another. And again, in order to be eligible for reasonable accommodation under the ADA, you have to be disabled. And we'll talk about what that means later on. So now I'm kind of getting the, the cart before the horse, so to speak. So when am I entitled to these types of reasonable accommodations if I am entitled? One can be in the application process. Let's go back to my, my cube mate. We'll call him Bob. Bob is in a wheelchair. He is applying for a job in this particular facility that is um, seeking candidates is, is a brand new. In fact, their, our office building hasn't even opened up. And so they're interviewing people in a, uh, a uh, you know, a temporary building. Um, and it's been rainy and muddy. And so, um, you know, they used to have a ramp, but the, the ramp wasn't working out. It got stuck in the mud and, and all that kind of stuff. And so all they have are stairs into the facility. Bob arrives for his interview, but, you know, because he's in a wheelchair, he's not able to get inside the facility. Now, at this point, um, he isn't an employee at all. It may well be that he's not qualified for the job, and he'll never be an employee. But he is entitled to reasonable accommodation even through the application and interview process. So this is, you could say, the pre-employment process. Candidates are entitled to that through this process. And actually, I'm going to say this to you, that while this is not where most of the discrimination claims arise under the ADA, this is the single trickiest area. So that's not probably the most, it's not the most dangerous in the sense it's most likely to result 
in charges and legal exposure, but it's the most dangerous in the sense that it's easiest to mess this up. And I would, I would submit to you that this is the area that's probably messed up most commonly in corporate America. I'm going to show you some resources. We'll, we'll visit this a little bit later as well, but I have some resources that I want to uh, bring to your attention here to kind of introduce you to some of the stuff here. Um, this is a website, um, EARN, that talks about uh, many different topics, but one of the topics it talks about is the interviewing process. And uh, when, you, when we're considering the interviewing process, you know, here you are, you're, you're getting ready to do some interviews. You don't have any reason to think that your next candidate is going to be disabled. I mean, people don't have to say, oh, by the way, you may not know this, but I'm disabled. Uh, they can just show up at the interview and you're looking at somebody who's in a wheelchair or who um, is blind or who um, seems to have perhaps uh, some kind of maybe psychiatric situation going on and you are like a deer in the headlights. You don't know what you can say. You don't know what you can't say. Um, you don't have any time to prep because they're there and the interview's happening. In fact, it may be in the middle of the interview when the person says to you, oh, by the way, I'm HIV positive, or oh, and by the way, I have bipolar disorder, or oh, and by the way, um, I happen to have brain cancer, and as a result, I have seizures regularly. Um, and so you don't even necessarily, you're not always even able to tell once they show up that that there is, a, is an issue that needs to be dealt with. And so because you haven't had any time to prep, you're having to do this on the fly. Now, once the employment relationship is established and maybe you get a request for reasonable accommodation, you have the ability to say, okay, thanks for letting me know, let me look into it. You get back to them the next day or maybe the two days. You've got time to talk to the right people and get the right information. Um, nobody's expecting you to be all knowing at that particular moment. But there's, you have to do something. You have to continue the interview and you have to not mess up. And that is a very intimidating position for you to be in. And so it's useful to train for this. Uh, to, if you are the HR person, to train your staff so that they know what to do. It's also useful to have regular repeats because, again, how many times are you going to have a disabled person show up who is in a wheelchair, who is blind, who is deaf, who uh, shares a mental uh, or a, a psychiatric issue that they may be confronting? Uh, it won't happen every day. It may not happen every year. And so you might forget what the, th what the things are you can ask, what the things are you can't ask. So it's good to have a refresher. Another good approach would be to have some kind of cheat sheet in your, in your desk drawer that you can pull out when you're doing that interview to refresh yourself. And of course, you can just say something as simple as, thank you for your time. I just need to review my notes for a second. And you can go over the notes. You don't have to let them see the notes so that you can make sure that you are well prepared and well positioned for success. Okay. So let's just go through a couple of points about um, what to do and what not to do. Um, as we said before, you want to make sure that your application forms and your interviewing locations are accessible to people with disabilities. You may say, well, how can an application form be accessible with people with disabilities? Well, if it's, inter if it's available on the internet, is, is your website designed that it is disability friendly, that it will allow disabled people perhaps to, that, that, that there's a function on it that will allow disabled people to um, have, have a reader read it for them or something along those lines. Um, you, um, it's a good idea also to interview applicants ahead of time so they know that they will need to do a particular task. Um, so that if there is some special accommodation they need, they can let you know beforehand. Now, you don't just let the disabled individuals know about this requirement. You let everyone know about this requirement. Again, because the disabled person may not, you may not be able to know ahead of time whether this person is disabled or not. And even if you were somehow or not and are able magically to know who's disabled or not simply by their resume, um, you shouldn't treat applicants differently in this regard. Um, and then you ought to make sure that all applicants feel comfortable and have the opportunity to ask for any reasonable accommodations that might come up. Um, 
For example, if an applicant has a visual impairment, they may need assistance in completing paperwork. So you or someone else might need to fill in the blanks for them. You might need to read it to them and then fill in the answer as it becomes appropriate. If somebody is deaf, then they may bring a uh, interpreter or they may ask you to hire an interpreter. Again, that's very appropriate for you to um, have those names already available um, and have uh, and if you don't, to then, of course, spring into getting that process taken care of. And there may be some other types of dis disabilities that um, might require some additional support. And so as, as you get the requests, you're going to need to kind of uh, think through, well, how am I going to accomplish that? And a really awesome, awesome tool for this is the Job Accommodation Network, which is oftentimes called JAN. Um, this website gives a ton of information, accommodation search, all this kind of stuff. Um, let me just kind of flip here and say, um, here we go. Let's pick a topic. Um, let's say, See, that's good in our accommodation search. That might be a better one. Okay, so let's say uh, your candidate is in a wheel, let's say not do a wheelchair, let's say hearing impaired. And it will list all different kinds of uh, software and other things um, and it will give you brand names and and uh, various uh, reviews and information about it. it's a tremendous resource um, to help with those things so you don't have to be all-knowing um, to be successful at accommodating um, there's lots of technologies that can help greatly So when you actually start the interview, whether you know beforehand or not, one of the things, of course, you want to do is make that applicant feel comfortable. If you're stressed because you don't know what to do, think about how stressed the applicant's going to be. Oh, this person's freaking out because I'm in a wheelchair. Um, that's not very welcoming or inviting to that person. Um, a, an interviewee is nervous enough without adding another layer to that. And so as the interview starts, you're going to want to focus on the job qualifications. Um, is this person the right fit for the job? Putting aside whether they're in a wheelchair or not, putting inside whether they're hearing impaired or not. Your job isn't to know all about the disability, but to know about the person and that who that person is. Obviously, you're going to tra treat that person with the same level of respect as you would any other candidate. You're also going to hold the person with disabilities to the same standards uh, that you would with other candidates. It's okay for that person not to be the best candidate. Imagine that you want somebody who has a bachelor's degree. This dis disabled person has a bachelor's degree, but you get another candidate who has a master's degree. That's even better. So you can hire the able-bodied person with a master's degree. That's not discriminatory to hire somebody who is more qualified than the disabled person. Then you should ask only job-related questions. You ought to, you know, it's human nature perhaps to wonder, well, exactly what is the illness or how did that happen or uh, what are the ins and outs of the limitations this person has. Uh, but that's really none of our business and it's not the purpose of the interview to find out this person's uh, private matters. Instead, we're focused upon job-related questions. So the question is, how will you be able to, let's say it's a receptionship, how will you be able to answer phones? How will you be able to uh, speak to people who come in? How will you be able to do the tasks that are part of that position? And um, so in relation to that, you ought to focus upon the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the experiences. Another thing that can sometimes happen is that you, who've never had this disability, may start thinking, well, gosh, I don't know how he would do that. And you, you, you don't know because you've not been disabled. So these, these are all categories of questions that you haven't been in a position that you've needed to work through. There might be some really simple fixes or simple approaches to making that uh, 
helping or having that person do the task that you aren't going to think of. So you're sitting there thinking, gosh, I can't imagine how that person in the wheelchair could possibly file in those top drawers. And so since I, in my 30 seconds of thinking about it, can't come up with the answer, I'm just going to assume there is no answer and not hire the person. Uh, keep in mind that this person has probably been living with this disability for a while. And even if this person hasn't been living with disability for a while, the Job Accommodation Network has people that will have been dealing with, with a similar disability for quite a while. And in many cases, the solution or the fix may be free or very inexpensive. But even if it is a significant amount of money, assuming that you're not a very small company, you're going to need to take on that responsibility if this person is the best qualified. You don't want to have an employment test unless you require that everybody take that employment test. And you, of course, are not going to ask people to take medical tests in any event. Um, so here are some things you want to avoid. You don't want to ask what happened to you. How did you, how did you, how will you get to work? That's not your business. The business is that they get to work. What sort of treatment are you going to need? What's a long-term prognosis? Instead, a good question is, how would you perform this particular task? You don't want to ask about leave. That can be a reasonable accommodation, so it's really not your business to ask about that. But you can state the attendance rules in your facility. So it might be, you know, employees here get two weeks of vacation a year, and they have five days of sick pay. Um, that can be an appropriate way to approach it. So, um, don't ask about accommodations, whether the employee will need it or what kind they will need. Do wait um, if the employee raises that issue. There's no need to get into something that may not even be appropriate or relevant to this particular uh, person's uh, situation. I have posted for your information this document which is Recruiting, Hiring, Retaining, and Promoting People with Disabilities, a resource guide for employers. This can be a very helpful a starting point for exploring these issues and helping you make good and wise choices in how you interact with applicants and employees with disabilities. So be sure to uh, look this over and read it before, um, it, well, as you complete this um, a module. Okay. So we are back. So we've talked about the application process. That's our, of our three by three. This is our first three of our three by three. And this is our first element of our three. Um, the next one is that we have to reasonably accommodate to enable a qualified person with disability to perform the essential functions of our job. This is the, the big one. This is the one that you're going to spend most of your time dealing. So you've hired Bob. He's in a wheelchair. He was the best qualified for the job. Now his job is to uh, file paperwork. And now you're trying to figure out, well, how is Bob going to file in that top cabinet? What's the right approach to that? There could be 50 different ways of addressing that issue. And so you are going to be engaging in an interactive process. You're going to be talking to Bob because Bob is probably an expert in how you manage with his particular circumstances. You may be uh, networking with organizations like the Job Accommodation Network to figure out what other people who've had wheelchair-bound employees who do filing, how they've handled that situation. Um, you're also going to consider the particulars of your space. Um, there may be certain uh, fixes and certain uh, challenges in your particular space that don't exist elsewhere. And so you think through those issues. It should be a collaborative, interactive process. It's probably not going to be resolved in 10 minutes, although sometimes they are that quick. Um, don't expect them to be that easy and don't expect them necessarily to work out without some research. But this is the most important, the most usual category that we see challenges. And then our third prong of our three prong, or our first three prong set is going to be that the ADA requires reasonable accommodation to enable an employee with a disability to enjoy equal benefits and privileges of employment. This isn't as common to get litigation, but let me explain to you what I mean about this. This means we have to have a bathroom for this person. And if this person is in a wheelchair, the bathroom that you currently have may not, its door or its stalls may be too narrow to allow him to or her to use uh, the bathroom facility. There may be a break room and the only access to that break room is stairs. Well, that means that this employee can't go to the break room. 
Um, it may not be essential to his employment, to the particular job duties that he has that he can go to the break room, but that's not good enough. If there's a break room for employees to grab a snack or to uh, put away stuff in their locker or to have lunch, then this disabled person has the same rights to participate in that, um, that community or that activity. So he or she is entitled to uh, access to that break room. So it may mean putting a ramp in or doing some other fix. Also, this would relate to things like employment benefits, health insurance, life insurance, those types of things. And so you have to make sure that you are providing those opportunities for employees who are disabled just as you would with able-bodied employees. Let's talk about another category. Um, this uh, th this one has to do with association. We talked about this with national origin and race. How somebody who is not may, we'll talk about the category of race. So let's say we have a Caucasian person, and this Caucasian person is married to a person of a different race, or perhaps has a child of a different race, or perhaps has a romantic partner of a different race, or has a roommate of a different race, or who knows what the permutations are. Um, sometimes that person might be discriminated against because of that association. They're not being discriminated against because they're Caucasian, they're just being discriminated against because they have this connection to somebody else. Well, this can happen in the disability situation. I may be perfectly able-bodied, but I have a disabled child, or I have a disabled spouse, or I have um, a disabled parent. It's not usually that my employer just hates disabled people and therefore wants to be mean to me because it doesn't, it doesn't like that I happen to have a family member who's disabled. Instead, how this oftentimes arises is that the employer starts thinking, oh, gosh, Groover's healthy, but she's got a kid with that serious illness. She's going to miss a lot of time or she's going to be really distracted at work because she's going to be worried about her kid. I'd be worried if I were in her shoes. I need somebody who can be focused, who can be here every day. And gosh, if you're dealing with that, you're not going to be as focused as I want. So I'm going to pass on Groover and I'm going to hire Bob instead because uh, Bob seems to not have any issues along those lines. So that's usually how associational disability discrimination plays out. Now, somebody who is associated with a disabled person is entitled to protection from discrimination under the ADA, but they're not entitled to any kind of reasonable accommodation. So let's say that I am hired. My, we'll say my child has um, a uh, serious uh, type of potentially fatal cancer. And um, so I, somehow or another, it's communicate, or maybe I'm applying for promotion. They already know that I happen to be confronted with this situation. Um, they decide to promote me because I'm the best qualified person for that. Um, and I start missing work because my child needs chemotherapy, needs surgery, uh, develops uh, infections often because of the treatment and cannot be, and I can, and I cannot be at home. And so I am taking the child to doctor's appointments. I'm keeping the child out of school and I'm missing a lot of work as a result. Well, the Americans Disability, excuse me, the Family Medical Leave Act is probably going to provide me with some level of protection, but the ADA gives me squat. There is no duty that the employer has to accommodate reasonably or otherwise me because I am not disabled. I'm merely associated with someone who's disabled. So under the Americans Disabilities Act, I can't be discriminated against, but the employer doesn't have to give me, you know, uh, time off from work to help my family member or anything along those lines. Again, Family and Medical Leave Act will probably apply, but that's for another chapter. So let's, so there is no duty to reasonably accommodate. Um, and again, this is to protect us against stereotypes because again, people have this idea, well, if you have a disabled family member, then it means you're not going to be able to uh, perform consistently at work because you're going to be distracted or you're going to have to often miss work. Another time that it comes up, and this was really a problem um, earlier in the um, uh, AIDS, HIV uh, scare in the 1990s where um, people would think, ah, um, Bob has a significant other who has AIDS. Well, Bob is probably going to get AIDS and therefore, 
um, we're going to have Bob be disabled as well. Bob says he's not now. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't, maybe he doesn't even know. And so sometimes the concern can be, well, this person through his or her association with the disabled person may himself become disabled. And again, that's usually through communicable diseases. Um, that uh, is less of a, of a hot, hot button issue today, but certainly it could still arise. And under those circumstances, Bob would be protected from um, discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act, even though he would not be titled reasonable accommodation. Now you might pause there and think, well, gosh, Groover, you told us earlier that sexual orientation is not a protected category. Well, that's true. Um, but if, it, let's say Bob is um, a gay and he has a same-sex partner who is HIV positive. Well, Bob does not have any statutory protections based upon his sexual orientation but he would be protected against discrimination based upon his association with somebody who is HIV. So he cannot be discriminated against because his partner is HIV. Now he could be discriminated against because he happens to have a same-sex partner, but not because that same-sex partner is HIV. So that's a kind of a fine point to that analysis. Again, I'm not recommending any type of uh, sexual orientation discrimination. Um, that probably isn't a smart idea to do for the employer, but it's not an unlawful thing to do. So in this course, we try to focus on what does the law say today that may be good public policy, may not be good public policy, but we're focusing upon the law. And then of course, individual organizations can and oftentimes do decide, well, that the law may only require we do X, but we want to do more than X because we think it's a good business decision or because our value system uh, points us in a certain direction. Okay, so let's consider this scenario. Bob applies for a position as a fundraiser in the Alumni Relations Department at Denton College. During the interview, he mentions to Mary, the person who's interviewing, that his wife has just been diagnosed with leukemia. In spite of Bob having eight years of fundraising experience, he's denied the job. Bob may well have an associational discrimination claim under the ADA if he can prove that the employer assumed his performance would be impaired because of his association with the disabled person. Again, oh, Bob's going to be so distracted with his wife. He's going to take off time to, to help her with her treatment. Uh, we just, we want somebody who's, who doesn't have those issues. That would be an example of associational discrimination. So I said earlier that the ADA, which became law in 1990, was amended in 2008. Generally, I don't like to focus on all the amendments that these laws go through, but this was an especially important one. And as you look through cases in this area, it's always a good idea to see whether the case that you're looking at was before 2008 or after 2008. Because if it's before 2008, there's a pretty good chance that that case may not be that helpful because when the statute changed, of course, all of the cases that were based upon that old statutory language are pretty useless now because that old statutory language is no longer in effect. Um, and so that's kind of a useful point. So you may say, well, why did Congress change the statute? Well, there's a pretty common uh, event or a pretty common set of circumstances that causes Congress to decide to change an event. What happened is that the U.S. Supreme Court issued a couple of big decisions, a Sutton and Toyota. Uh, these two are the, the big decisions. Uh, I think it was during the same a term of the U.S. Supreme Court. And what the U.S. Supreme Court is it interpreted already existing language in the um, a statute, the ADA. And, it, and the, the U.S. Supreme Court interpreted those terms narrowly. And when I say narrowly, what I mean is they interpreted it in such a way that fewer people were going to be covered by the ADA than some people thought was intended originally by Congress. Uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court in this rule is not, uh, there's no constitutional aspect to it. It's just good old-fashioned statute interpretation. Well, when, these, uh, when the uh, Congress learned of these two decisions that the U.S. Supreme Court made, Congress was quite unhappy. Um, and it said, no, U.S. Supreme Court, you misinterpreted. You did not understand what we intended in 1990 when we passed this law. So we're going to solve this problem by changing the statute. We're going to rewrite the parts that you misinterpreted so it's crystal clear what we want you to do. 
And so once the Congress changed the laws, that U.S. Supreme Court decision, I mean, it's still in the books, but it's, it's pretty useless because it's interpreting a, a statutory language that doesn't exist anymore. And whenever Congress changes the language uh, that, that was, in its opinion, misinterpreted, then really uh, what the U.S. Supreme Court did is, is only for historical reasons really useful. Now, this doesn't always work when we're talking about a constitutional aspect because, of course, the Congress doesn't have the power to change the U.S. Constitution um, like it can a, a statute. So uh, when, the, when uh, the U.S. Supreme Court is interpreting the Constitution, it's, it's a little bit more of an enduring change than when we're looking at statutory interpretations. Anyway, there were two particular cases that really got Congress kind of worked up. And that was, the first one was that um, in, in, the, in the, this case, the U.S. Supreme Court said, you know what, sometimes when you have a disability, there's just a really easy fix to it. For example, uh, I happen to wear eyeglasses. I'm not legally blind or anything, but I'm pretty disoriented without my glasses on. Um, I would not be very effective doing too many things if I didn't have my glasses. I get nauseated. Um, I really almost can't read. I have to get it up to my nose to be able to read. And so without my glasses, I, I'm not functioning too well. But you know what? All I have to do is put on my glasses and my world is 2020. Problem solved. I don't have any issues. So there is something that mitigates or solves my problem pretty much completely. And sometimes there is something like that. Um, it may be some technology, it may be some device, and suddenly everything is okay. Another example would be an insulin-dependent diabetic. Let's say this person has well-controlled, well-managed diabetes. Some people do, some people don't, but in this case, this person does. He or she remembers to take his or her shot, test the insulin level. Maybe they even have an insulin pump, and so they don't even have to do necessarily all of the things that used to, you know, the finger pricks and things like that. And this person, their blood sugar works just fine, and everything is hunky-dory. Um, in many respects, it's kind of almost like they don't have diabetes as long as the system is working. The mitigating measure that they're using, the insulin pump or the insulin injections, solve the problem. And so what, the, what Sutton said was, well, in that case, this person really isn't disabled as long as they have this fix. Well, that's what got the Congress steam. The Congress said, no, a diabetic we ought to evaluate without considering the mitigating measure. A diabetic who is insulin dependent, who is denied insulin, is going to die because their pancreas doesn't work. And so it's a, it's a death sentence for those individuals. And so obviously that qualifies as a disability. So we shouldn't evaluate a disability looking at how easily or completely we can fix it. We should look at the disability in the untreated circumstance. Okay, let me give you another example. Let's say I have schizophrenia. I happen to have it very well managed with medication, and um, when I'm on my medication, I'm just a pretty typical person, don't really have any issues. But if I get off my medication, I am hearing voices, I am just really not functioning. So clearly, without the mitigating circumstances, I am absolutely disabled. Under the Sutton U.S. Supreme Court decision, I would not be disabled because of the mitigating uh, measures, but under the 2008 amendments that the Congress passed, I would be considered disabled. Now, one thing that the, the Congress did say was that we're not going to consider eyeglasses. I mean, we are going to consider eyeglasses. So if the only reason you're disabled is that you need your eyeglasses, Congress says that's the one mitigating measure that we are going to allow the courts to consider. But all the rest, hearing aids, wheelchairs, prostheses, um, insulin, medication, all that stuff, um, we're going to consider the person without those conditions before, when, we, when we're trying to determine whether they're disabled or not. Another thing that uh, came up, or the second round of, of issues, was what did we at what was actually meant by the term substantial and major life activities? Uh, because we haven't looked at this yet, but the definition of dis disability, um, you know, you can imagine it being very broad or very narrow. And so uh, we, we'd have to kind of decide, well, 
what's going to meet our definition of disabled? Do we want it to be such that it has a very broad category, a lot of folks are covered, or do we want it to cover just a relatively small percentage of people? Well, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court interpreted some of the, the very important definitional terms related to disability in a relatively narrow way, which meant that the universe of people that satisfy the definition was relatively small. Again, Congress said, no, 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 we want this to apply, apply to a relatively large category of folks. And so we're going to rewrite these, these important terms, the definitions of the important terms, so that they cover more people. And so these are the two big things that happened in 2008. So again, you can see both of these um, changes were designed to increase the number of people who would be covered um, by, uh, would be considered disabled and therefore would enjoy the protections of the ADA. Okay, so we have covered our three, our first three, you know, so we, I said there were three by three. And so we've covered our first of our three by uh, of our three prong. So this is this is our our first three prong, and now we're going to do our second three prong. So our our middle three by three, we're ready for. And this one is the most important for sure. This is one we will return to several times in this presentation. Uh, this is really really important stuff. I had over here the term substantially and major. Let me just go back here and show you. And those terms actually appear right here. What these terms mean is what was changed in 2008. So our second of our three prong tests we're gonna look at again, this is the main thing. The term disability means a qualified person who meets any one of the following. So I can fit under this category or I can fit under this category or I can fit under this category. And oftentimes a particular person will fit under two, sometimes even three of these categories. Um, but by far the most common, the uh, central one is going to be this, this first one. So let's look at the first one a little bit. Having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of the individual. So we can see here that we have physical problems such as vision loss, hearing loss, uh, missing limb in a wheelchair, cancer, um, diabetes, but we also have mental impairment and these can be psychiatric issues such as bipolar, depression, schizophrenia, but it could also be intellectual limitations such as Down syndrome or some other uh, condition that has, has caused there to be intellectual uh, limitations or intellectual differences, such as learning differences. Uh, so both of those categories can be covered, or of course they can both be present. So we have some kind of impairment that substantially limits. So what does substantially mean? And we'll talk in more detail about what it means now after 2008. Substantial limits one or more of the major life activities of the individual. What's a major life activity? Again, we'll see a list of these later on. And the list actually grew significantly after 2008. So we'll see how the list has evolved. So this is category one. Categories two and three were not as changed um, by uh, the, the amendments in 2008. But number two is having a record of having such an impairment. So, I might have had cancer in the past, I'm currently cancer free, so I'm no longer disabled, but my employer may be aware of my former disability. So let's say I had cancer, I almost died, I am now uh, in remission, or perhaps I've even been found to be cancer free, but my employer may still be reluctant to give me um, an important role or a, a more demanding position because they may be afraid that the cancer will return. Well, I can't say that I'm disabled because I, I'm, I don't meet that definition at this moment, but I have protection as having a record of impairment. And then finally, I'm entitled to protection if the employer regards me as, as having an impairment. Maybe I never had an impairment, but the employer thinks that I have had the impairment. Let's go back to our example of Bob. Bob is in a, a, a romantic relationship with Chris and Chris is HIV positive. Um, 
Bob is not HIV positive, uh, but the employer may regard Bob as being HIV positive incorrectly because Bob's partner is HIV positive. So it's an incorrect assumption. Bob himself is not disabled. He doesn't meet number one, uh, have actually being disabled. He also doesn't meet two because he's never been disabled. He's never had HIV or AIDS. Um, but now he's being viewed as having it simply because of some other reason. And so that can be a third characteristic. It's not really so important being able to distinguish two from three. Um, they, as you can see, there's a lot of overlap between these two. Uh, the big distinction is between one and two or three. And the big reason that you want to make the distinction between one and then these second categories is that you have to reasonably accommodate number ones, but you don't have to accommodate twos and threes. So again, these are the three prongs of disability def definition. So we've gone through that first set of prongs. Let me just refresh you about when these answer the when question. Pre-employment, employment, benefits. And now we've, just, now we've provided our second of our three by three, when we've defined dis disability. We've seen the three prongs here. We'll have one more coming up in a little bit, so look out for that. So as I said before, this change in the law greatly expanded the definition, ended up covering a lot more employees. In fact, the Congress said is, listen, courts, and up until two, uh, 2008, a lot of these decisions seem to be turning on, is this person disabled? Is this person not disabled? Well, Congress told the courts, said, get over yourselves. We're not interested in that. You know, the, these folks are usually going to be disabled. I mean, we're not going to say 100%. I mean, if you have a hangnail or something, no, you're not disabled. Uh, or you have halitosis, no, you're not disabled. But, I mean, generally speaking, we don't want that to be what this law is about or what this, the case law is about, is whether the person's disabled or not, err on the side of inclusion. Uh, we want to see actual cases in which we try to figure out how to accommodate, not so much is this person disabled or not. Okay, and this is, again, a little bit more clarity because we were, were talking before about the term substantially limits. Well, again, in the amendments in 2008, an impairment does not need to prevent or severely or significantly restrict a major life activity to be considered substantially limiting a major life activity. So um, I might have, um, for example, limited vision, but I can still see some. Um, I may not be severely limited in my ability to see and, and still find that I am substantially limited. Another thing that's important to remember is that I might have a variety of impairments and each one of those individually may not meet this definition, but when you co collect them and they may be related to each other and may be unrelated to each other. When you start putting them together, you know, it's like a, a house of, or like a building where you, know, you have one la layer and then another layer and another layer. Eventually the building gets pretty tall, although each la uh, level itself isn't particularly tall because they uh, uh, compound each other. Well, the, it's only you, what you wait is you wait to see, well, what are all the disabilities? And then, then you make a judgment about whether uh, one or more major life activities are being substantially restricted. So let's consider a scenario. Bob has two disabilities. It could well be that neither one of them in and of themselves would qualify as being substantially limiting of a major life activity. But in this case, both of them together uh, would qualify as a substantially limiting major life activity. So Bob has a mild intellectual disability and he also has a mild form of ADHD. Though other tasks are difficult to perform, Bob enjoys and he's accomplished at gardening. And so he's become a professional gardener. He applies for a job and he tells the interviewer that despite his impairment, I guess you should say impairments, because he has two, he has been able to work as a gardener in private gardens and estates and they've never had any issues with his work. The employer decides not to hire him fearing that the disability might affect others' work. Bob might be a distraction, uh, for other workers, maybe they're concerned that he's going to need more help, um, that he's going to be too chatty, that he's going to lack focus, and so they decide not to give him a chance. 
but in this case, even though Bob's two problems are mild in and of themselves, um, in combination, they could easily uh, substantially re restrict a, a major life activity and could therefore be considered a disability under the ADA. So again, you have to be aware that some things that might at first glance seem not so serious um, can actually uh, trigger ADA protection. So we are done with the introduction. Now we're going to go into prima facie case. That's our second topic. And uh, let's begin. Okay, so this, these are our four elements. You may have recalled from our earlier lectures, we had four requirements for the prima facie case. And these are going to track very closely with the four that we saw seen before. So the first one is that the um, person has a disability, or more correctly put, going back here, one, it fits under one of these three prongs. So it could be under one or two or three. So it could be regarded as having a disability or a record of being a, having a disability. You can see how this is very similar to the Title VII stuff and to the um, Age Discrimination Employment Act stuff because basically what we're saying is that this person has to be a member of a protected class that this statute protects. And this statute is all about protecting the disabled. So before we were talking about Title VII, we said, well, this person has to be a member of a particular race. This person has to be a member of a particular gender. This person has to be over the age of 40. So they always have a qualification uh, that puts that person in the protected class. Now, in many classes, it may be obvious what class that person belongs to. For example, in most cases, it's pretty obvious whether the person is male or female. In many cases, it'll be pretty obvious whether the person is over 40. Um, or, or perhaps that person's race might be, be obvious as well. And so, you know, there's really no discussion or, or reflection upon whether this person fits this particular category or not. In the areas of disability, though, many times disabilities are hidden, not obvious. And so the burden is on the employee to prove that he or she is disabled. The employer doesn't have any obligation to disprove a disability. So the burden is on the employee. And that makes sense because, after all, the employee is the plaintiff and the burden of, of the prima facie case is going to be on the plaintiff. Uh, now, this isn't, again, novel. If there was some dispute about my gender or my race in a Title VII case, yes, I would have the responsibility to prove those aspects. It's just usually not a controversial subject, but it can be controversial under the Americans with Disabilities Act. The second thing that the plaintiff is going to have to prove to establish a prima facie case is that he or she is otherwise qualified for the position. Putting aside the whole disability thing, he is qualified for the position. Again, this is the exact same language that we've seen under Title VII. So there's nothing new here under the sun. It's the same thing. We need to have somebody who's a member of a protected class. We need to have them be qualified. So one and two are going to be very familiar. Three is a little bit different. This one here, the second one under three, and we just need one or the other of these, is what we expect, is the type of thing that we've seen talked about under Title VII that he or she suffered an adverse employment action, such as a termination or demotion. That's usually what we see in a Title VII case. Either they are failure to hire, failure to promote, failure, uh, a decision to terminate, a decision to demote. And of course, when we, we do see those in disability cases. And when we have that, we have satisfied our third element. What's new, though, is this first one, which is and it's an either-or situation. So if you have this one, you don't need this. If you have this one, you don't need this. And that is when a reasonable accommodation is requested, then the, uh, the, the accommodation must, or, or, or um, let me put it this way, that the employee has requested a reasonable accommodation and it hasn't been provided. And so the employee is being denied that reasonable accommodation. Well, obviously that's relevant to an ADA case, but under Title VII, except in the areas of religion, there is no duty to reasonable accommodation. It doesn't make any sense to say, I'm going to reasonably accommodate your national origin. What does that even mean? I'm going to reasonably accommodate your gender. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think you need to accommodate my gender. I'm going to reasonably accommodate your race. Again, doesn't really make sense, but it makes sense when we're talking about religion because of the particular requirements some religions have in terms of days off work or things along those lines. And it obviously also works with disability. So this is the, the wrinkle that's, that's to the prima facie case that we haven't seen before. 
And then number four, you may recall when we talked about prima facie case, prima facie case before was kind of a catch-all. You needed one more piece of evidence other than what we've talked about. And usually that fourth piece is somebody who isn't in the same protected, cat, protected class was hired instead or was put into your position after you were dismissed. Um, but what the fourth element is can vary. And so this is the way that at least I've seen it uh, written sometimes, and that is the decision was based upon a discriminatory motive or a failure to reasonably accommodate. This is that fourth element that can be a little bit of a loosey-goosey element um, on all, all the different type categories of prima facie case. Here's another way of looking at the prima facie case analysis. So uh, they kind of get to the same endpoint, but this is just a different take on it. Let's assume that the employee is able to establish a prima facie case. As I said before, usually establishing the prima facie case is not hard. This is usually, although in the case of employment discrimination, excuse me, uh, uh, disability discrimination, uh, proving or, or, or worrying about whether this person is actually disabled oftentimes does result in some analysis. Um, so there's a little bit more oomph behind the prima facie case establishment in the situation of the ADA. Under most Title VII and Ameri uh, Age Discrimination Employment Act, the prima facie case is almost obvious. It's like, we don't even really need to bother with this because that's not where the game is. The game is after the prima facie case is proven. And that's oftentimes true under disability discrimination. So let's assume that the employee has proven the prima facie case. Well now, just as we established under Title VII and Age Discrimination Employment Act, the burden shifts to the employer to establish a discriminatory, a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the employment action. It could be that Bob was not doing his job. He was goofing off or he wasn't able to meet the reasonable employment uh, uh, expectations of the employer. Um, so that certainly can be a basis uh, for finding a non-discriminatory reason for the employment action. Uh, poor job performance is an excellent one. Um, there is no BF, BFOQ for disability-free employees. You know, we talked about with, um, uh, for example, religion. If, if I happen to be running a meat processing plant and I want to cater, literally, <laughs> to the kosher customer base, then I'm going to need to have kosher processes set up to uh, appeal to that community because they are only going to want food that has been certified as kosher. And I know I'm going to have to hire a rabbi to accomplish that task. And so a BFOQ for at least one member of my staff will be that he or she needs to be a rabbi. Um, you can have that with religion. You can have that with gender but you can't have that with disability. You also can't have it, by the way, for race. Uh, so there is no BFOQ defense for disability-free employees. Okay, so we are now done with the prima facie case. Now we're gonna go on and kind of do, as you can see, there's lots of sub bullets here. We're gonna kind of break down some of these vocabulary terms we've been playing around with into a little bit more granularity. And uh, let's begin with that. Okay. So um, when we talk about, when we were, you know, when we were dealing with our first three-prong approach, we talked about, you know, the pre-employment situation, then we talked about the employment situation, then we talked about kind of the fringe benefits situation. We'll call that the extra employment or the outside of, of strictly the, the workaday world type of employment. We're gonna get a little bit more granular here. We're gonna break those, those kind of three fairly broad categories and kind of pick them apart and explore them in a little bit more detail. Um, one thing is we can't segregate or classify employees into, you know, disabled, non-disabled, or here's our folks who need, you know, uh, wheelchair access, and these are our folks who need uh, vision help, and here are folks who need whatever that particular issue is. So there's um, a, a segregation or, or somehow sorting of folks into these categories. Uh, we can't do that. We can't do that as applicants. We can't do this as employees. We need to make sure that the standards we're using 
in terms of either hiring people or maintaining employment are also not discriminatory, that our standards are reasonable and that uh, they consider the disabled, the, the disabled status of the folks that we're working on. Um, we can't exclude or deny equal uh, jobs or benefits to folks who are disabled. We need to make sure our selection criteria doesn't tend to screen out. Again, if we are uh, screening people, uh, well, for example, let, let's assume that the job is on a bus line. Um, and so it would be very easy for disabled people who are unable to drive to take the bus to work. But you actually interview folks for the position in a place that is not bus accessible. And so those same disabled people who would have had a, an easy way to get to the employment position are not able to get to the interview. That would be an example of uh, some method that is screening folks out. And then, of course, if you're going to use employment tests, you want to make sure that they are administered in a way that is not going to screen out people because of a disability. You may recall we talked about disability previously, and there was the example of the case where the applicant had dyslexia, meaning that he had a difficulty with reading. The nature of the job wasn't one that was going to require reading, um, and so uh, at least not a lot of reading. And so therefore, the test really wasn't measuring what the employer truly needed. The employer truly needed somebody who could do these particular tasks and know how to do it safely. And that could be done or tested through an oral test or maybe through a written test that gave the applicant more time. And really, the written test the applicant failed, not so much because he didn't know the answers, but because of the format of the test. So the format wasn't predictive of the success that this particular employee would have. So dyslexia would be an example of a potential disability that you have to think through in terms of your employment tests. Okay, so we've already seen this definition before. It's exactly the same definition that I had in blue. This is our second uh, three-prong uh, a collection. Uh, I've kind of covered this before, but let me just touch on this. Correctable disabilities are covered, so again, we don't consider mitigating characteristics except, of course, for the whole um, eyeglasses or contacts. Another issue that sometimes comes up is when we have somebody who is who meets the definition of being obese. Uh, that condition can be qualified as a disability, but usually we're looking to what has caused this person to become obese? Uh, for example, perhaps this person has a, a genetic disorder that um, it causes a, a range of systems in the body not to function in a typical manner. And one of the ways that it manifests itself is through uh, obesity. And so that would be an example. A person who's um, only symptom of the disability is obesity is probably not going to be successful under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, the term obesity is defined by the medical community to include a range of diagnoses. And the term morbid uh, obesity is the highest level where the person is uh, sufficiently obese that his or her health is compromised in a significant way. And so that can sometimes qualify in and of itself. We're talking about people who are very large, not simply uh, you know, someone overweight or something along those lines. So let's consider this scenario. Mary is a kindergarten assistant at a, at a school. Since Mary suffers from obesity, obesity, she's not able to use the chairs provided for teachers in the kindergarten rooms. Uh, they're too small for her. Perhaps uh, they aren't able to support her weight. Mary requests a different chair, but her employer refuses. Mary is um, protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act only if her obesity is due to physiological condition. So she can point to, I'm obese because I happen to have this disease. If she is obese um, and she isn't able to connect it to a physiological condition, then very likely she does not meet the ADA definition. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that the employer is making a good choice. I would argue that that would be a poor decision. Uh, Mary is going to need to sit sometimes. She's going to get tired. She's going to have to sit as she's working with the students. And somebody who is um, obese is 
likely to need to sit down more often perhaps than somebody who's typical size. And so is the employer really accomplishing the goal of having the most productive employee by denying Mary a seat when other individuals who work as uh, kindergarten assistants are able to sit down? So yes, the employer probably can legally refuse, but is it a good idea? I'm not so sure about that. Sometimes um, we will have situations in which there's a disability plus uh, situation regarding hiring. Uh, so for example, in this situation, maybe Mary has um, Hashimoto's syndrome. I think that's a, a, a disease that can has serious repercussions plus it can lead to obesity as a symptom of the disease. Um, and so in that situation, a Mary might have Hashimoto's disease plus obesity. Um, but it may be that um, the, the plus factor, in this case obesity, may not be eligible for the accommodation, even though the Hashimoto's may be eligible for the accommodation. Again, this is a gray area, a differing perspectives might be on this, I would argue that a cautious employer is going to want to accommodate both the disability and the disability plus the, the additional thing. Uh, let me give you another example. Let's say that um, I had an aneurysm and as a result of the aneurysm, um, my the, the um, right side of my vision in both eyes I no longer have. I can only see out of both eyes, the um, left side of my vision. Um, the left side of my vision is um, not typical. I am 50 years old and I have to wear um, bifocals so that I can see clearly because of the natural process of aging. Most 50 year olds need to wear bifocals or need to wear at least the, the glasses to make things bigger. So you could say that I'm in a disability plus situation. My vision problem, putting aside the bifocals, is definitely going to qualify as disability. Um, the employer has to accommodate that. Does the employer have to accommodate my bifocal need? Well, because it's an, uh, possibly not. Um, but possibly so. So that's a, a, a complicated, something to be aware of and to think through. Probably in many cases it's not necessary, but it's not necessary, it's probably not a fight that many employers are going to want to take on. As we said before, the, the amendments in 2008 did significantly increase the number of individuals who are covered. So if you receive training about the ADA prior to 2008, um, this is a good time to update it uh, because the world really did kind of change in terms of ADA at that time. So let's look at some examples of disabilities. Most of these we probably look at and go, well, yeah, of course that's a disability. Of course that's a disability. I want to though flag a couple that might be a bit of a surprise. One is epilepsy. This is kind of a hidden disability. Um, and certainly um, it can be a serious situation that can raise important safety issues in the working environment. Many times it's a disability that isn't uh, identified as something that this employee is experiencing until the seizure happens. It may be that the employee himself or herself did not know that he or she had this condition at that until the, the seizure happens, or it could be that they chose not to share the information. Um, and so um, that can be a specially challenging issue, especially when we're when we get to the direct threat situation, it presents special issues. Another uh, category that can present special issues is HIV and AIDS, uh, or, or I guess the special issue with that is um, that in some sense, they oftentimes aren't, dis or especially HIV isn't really a disability. Uh, somebody who is HIV positive may have zero symptoms, may be perfectly fit, and may not actually progress to full-blown AIDS for quite some time. And I don't even know for sure if everybody who has, who has tested positive for HIV always transitions to full-blown AIDS. And I, that's a, another issue I'm just not a, a fully aware of. So you might say somebody with HIVs, I mean, what major life activity is being significantly limited? 
perhaps none, but the Americans with Disabilities Act says, tells us somebody who's HIV positive is covered, in part because of the uh, stigma associated with that. They certainly would meet the second prong of being, um, having a history of a disability and the third prong of being regarded as disabled. Below here I have some examples of psychiatric disabilities. Again, somewhat, somewhat like epilepsy, these are uh, disabilities that are, are for the most part uh, hidden disabilities. You can't look at somebody and know that they happen to have these circumstances. As a result of the fact that they are to some degree hidden, sometimes employees do not share these diagnoses as soon as uh, they become aware of them or, um, or soon in the process of kind of dealing with problems relating to this. And so you have to be aware that this can kind of come up relatively late in the game. Another issue can be that the uh, supervisor or the manager may not take these issues overly seriously. They might say, well, I, you know, I don't care what their mental health is. I care about whether they do this particular job. But it could be that their diagnosis is interfering with their ability to do the job. And so it's important to uh, have your uh, managers know that we're not, when we're talking about the ADA, we're not just talking about people needing, you know, a wheelchair or people needing a hearing aid. We're talking about people needing lots of uh, differing approaches to um, uh, helping that person be successful in the employment scenario. And these are definitely covered, and these are just a sample. There are many other diagnoses that could also uh, be considered disabilities. So let's consider an HIV situation. Bob is a customer service representative in this airline. He's confided to one of his coworkers that he's positive for HIV. Unfortunately for Bob, the co-worker is a blabbermouth and has told lots of other people. Soon, he, Bob is ostracized at work. People don't want to work with him. He's subject to verbal abuse. So Bob reports this to his supervisor. What does the supervisor do? Fires him. Oh my gosh, how terrible. Um, under these circumstances, Bob absolutely has a claim of uh, disability discrimination as a hostile work environment and also because of just flat out uh, discrimination. So hostile work environment and disparate treatment, both of those theories uh, Bob would have a good claim for. So let's consider some carve outs, some things that the ADA has specifically said, these aren't disabilities. And when they say they aren't disabilities, they don't really mean that they don't meet the definition. They may well meet the definition. Um, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of the, of the individual. Uh, so the issue isn't that they don't meet the definition, but the issue is that the Congress specifically said, no, we're not covering these. For whatever policy reason or political reason, they've ex ex excluded them. So for example, transvestitism, transsexualism, pedophilia, exhibitionism, voyeurism, gender identity disorders, uh, sometimes this is referred to as being transgender, um, and that they're excluding from this people who are the, the, who have gender identity disorders who do not also have some kind of physical impairment. For example, somebody who is intersex. Uh, that's the uh, a term that is now used for people who have um, uh, genitals that are consistent with, say, both both genders, or people who've had injuries to their genitals. Uh, that those individuals could be covered in the American Disabilities Act, but people have gender dis, uh, gender identity disorders who are not who there isn't a physical uh, explanation for that issue, and other sexual behavior disorders, also a compulsive damning, kleptomania, pyromania, and then uh, psychiatric issues that are related to illegal use of drugs. That is current. We'll talk more about this going forward in our second lecture. And also homosexuality, bisexuality um, are also not considered impairments or disabilities under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So again, that's not another path for um, advancing uh, protections for people who are um, transgendered or who are uh, gay or lesbian. There are some additional situations, obviously there's human uh, variation, 
And so uh, hair color can't be considered a disability. Hair texture can't be considered a disability. Eye color. Being left-handed isn't a disability. Uh, having a particular height or weight that is within uh, a quote-unquote a normal range. Having a predisposition to an illness. Now that can fall into the category of being regarded as. So let's say that my mom has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My employer might be concerned, well, maybe Groomer's going to get Alzheimer's. Um, that is ordinarily not going to be a protected reason unless it start, the employer starts regarding me as having Alzheimer's. Pregnancy is not a disability, primarily for, well, for two reasons. One is that it's short. It's going to resolve itself in nine months, right? But also because we had the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which um, amended Title VII to include protections for pregnant individuals. Um, also, personality traits. Um, uh, there's natural variations, sometimes people are impulsive or they make bad decisions. And those are, and if they're not related again to a psychiatric or mental uh, 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 issue, are not going to be considered covered. And then additionally, people who have, uh, uh, have, have experienced poverty or have not advanced from an educational perspective or as a prison record, they are not considered disabled. Now, it might be that they lack education because a disability interfered with their ability to get an education. For example, perhaps they had childhood cancer and they weren't able to attend school for a significant period of time. Or perhaps they had a learning difference such as dyslexia or yeah, dyslexia that inter, inter, impeded their ability to acquire the education. Um, it, it would be their disability, the childhood cancer or the dyslexia that would be entitled to protection, not the fact that they never got their high school or college degree or something along those lines. Again, it could be that because this person had um, a, uh, we'll say, a, maybe they were an alcoholic, that their alcoholism led them into a life of crime, which led to a prison record. Alcoholism is a disability, but the prison record isn't. So you have to separate these things. These might be the results of a disability, that and the disability is still going to be covered, but they themselves are not disabilities. Just as we saw with Age Discrimination Employment Act, there is no reverse discrimination claims. If I am able-bodied and I am just uh, frustrated that my employer is giving um, uh, someone else in the obvious office a larger screen or more breaks or whatever, I want to participate in that even though I'm able body, I'm not going to be successful with that because I am um, able-bodied and so reverse discrimination claims under the ADA are not going to be permitted. So here we have again this is our, our three prongs for the disability definition so this is our second of our three three prong items here. We've already seen these before and we're going to do a though for this time we're going to do a bit more of a drill down so we're going to focus on number one first. And again, this is the definition we've already talked about. Having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of the individual. And this is what most of us would probably think of when we think about disability. So let's drill down here and talk a little bit more about this. As I said before, both physical and mental impairments are covered. We need to do an individualized assessment. So it could be that there could be somebody who has disease A and they aren't disabled, but that same disease with dis for, for Bob might mean that, they, that Bob is disabled. So we don't see under the ADA a list of, you know, 50 diseases. Say, okay, this one's covered, this one's not, this one's covered, this one's not. Uh, for example, perhaps I suffer from migraines, but I only get one migraine a year, and it's just one single day that I'm pretty miserable. I have migraines, but I probably don't meet the definition of disabled. But Bob also has migraines, except he has, you know, at least one or two a week, and they last for at least a day, and he can't really do anything when he's having it. He probably is going to meet the definition of disability, disabled. Even though we have the same diagnosis, you have to do that individualized assessment. 
Okay, so let's look at these terms. We first of all talked about how 2008, they, uh, the Congress decided to amend it to cover these or to define these terms a little differently. So examples of major life activities, one is caring for oneself. Uh, can this person dress himself or herself, bathe himself or herself, use the bathroom himself or herself, feed himself or herself, uh, those types of self-care. If it's not possible for that person to do that, then definitely they are limited, substantially limited in major life activity. Performing manual tasks, again, when we say manual, we're thinking about hands here. Can this person um, open doors? Can this person wash dishes? Can this person um, do tasks with his or her hands? Maybe the hands are missing. Maybe there's paralysis of the hands. Those would be th maybe severe um, arthritis makes the hand so uh, sensitive to pain that he cannot use those. Other examples of major life activities are seeing, hearing, eating, breathing, speaking, all of those would be major life activities. So you can imagine somebody who has severe asthma might be substantially limited in the major life activity of breathing. Another person who has maybe um, a little bit of wheeziness once or twice a year, maybe they'd meet the definition of asthma, but they perhaps are not substantially limited in the major life activity of breathing. So again, it's an individual analysis. These oftentimes fall into the learning differences category. Concentrating, thinking, communicating, these can be examples uh, of learning differences and also disabilities. So this might be ADHD or this might be ADHD. This also could, could uh, involve intellectual limitations. Communicate, this could be dyslexia or perhaps this person has a, a stuttering issue. Those can be disabilities as well. Working is a really big category, obviously, um, and that can qualify as a disability, but not when a person is disqualified from a single job. It really needs to be um, from, you know, kind of a category of jobs. So let's say a particular job um, requires that I be able to walk across a tightrope. Maybe I'm going to be a trapeze or a work for the circus, and I don't have a good sense of balance, and that might be a disability, um, or at least a disability, not not as a legal term as me, but it's a, it's an impairment, and as a result of this impairment, I cannot successfully walk on the tightrope. But I am not substantially limited in the major life activity of working because guess what? Most jobs don't require that I work on a tightrope. And so I would not be considered disabled simply because I'm excluded from one particular job. So exa other examples would be standing, lifting, and bending. In addition to major life activities, we also have that a person can be disabled because there's a, they're substantially limited in one or more major bodily functions, such as the brain, bladder, normal cell growth. This might be, for example, leukemia, the reproductive system, the immune system functioning. All of these will be major bodily functions. Again, that's an addition from 2008. So let's consider our scenario here. So Mary experiences extensive verbal abuse and teasing at work because she stutters. Mary wants to file a complaint of workplace harassment under the ADA. She can bring a claim for workplace harassment if she can show that her speech impediment, her stuttering, um, affects a major life activity or maybe she's regarded as disabled and so that would be a circumstance that she could be successful with that claim. Now you might think to yourself, well gosh the average person wouldn't consider studying to be a major uh, to be a disability and that's where it requires that the employer be as sensitive and aware of these issues as they arise. So we've talked about, excuse me, we've talked about, um, back a little farther, we're still, we're still talking about, well, we've talked about uh, major life activities and major bodily functions. Now we're going to focus on this part of our definition. the substantially limits part. Um, the ADA uh, defines the term substantially limits to requires the term be interpreted consistently with the findings and purpose of the act. And here we have our definition, substantially limited. An individual does not need to have an impairment that prevents or severely or significantly restricts a major life activity to be considered substantially limited, nor does the impairment need to last for a set period of time. 
In addition, we can combine impairments as we did with, with, with Bob who had the mild um, ADHD and the mild intellectual limitation. Uh, perhaps each one of them separately would not meet the definition of substantially limited, but in combination they might. Uh, we've already kind of done the major life activities. And again, they don't have to relate to job duties. Uh, for example, um, I think I have it next on the next slide here. Oh, here we go. Um, I have a couple thinking, um, working, and actually, I guess I have it under major bodily functions. Uh, reproductive functions. Well, most jobs don't require reproductive functions, right? But let's say that somebody is infertile or is experiencing infertility. They might need time off from work to undergo treatments, maybe surgery, maybe other treatments to uh, rectify that particular issue. Now, the employer probably doesn't care one way or the other whether Bob or Sally uh, reproduces or not, but Bob or Sally would meet the definition of disabled if he or she is infertile because that's substantially limiting the major life activity or the major bodily function of reproduction. And we can see some of these others. I mean, there's lots of jobs where you don't have to read. There's lots of jobs where you don't have to bend over. But if you're substantially limited in these major life activities, even though it's not impacting your work performance, it might mean that you need to take time off from work to address those issues. And the employer is required to reasonably accommodate that in many cases. OK. Um, a temporary impairment, though, is not a disability. Impairments lasting less than six months are usually considered temporary. There's no magic bullet here. It's going to be the totality of the circumstances. But six months is kind of usually considered a good cutoff time. Um, certainly, if it's under that, it's probably not going to be considered a disability. Um, six months in one day is probably still going to be considered temporary. But at some point, not too far over that, we're in the area where we probably are in the major life activity category. We've already talked about individualized assessments. We've talked about uh, working again. Uh, thinking is another one. Uh, this can fit into that. Uh, uh, learning differences category, how you think, how you concentrate, how you communicate. And again, many times people don't think about these as being disabilities, but certainly uh, diagnoses like dyslexia, or ADHD, things along those lines uh, can definitely qualify as disabilities under the ADA. Okay. Um, to be covered, the impairment must be severe, chronic, or expected to have a long-term impact upon functioning. So here we go. Now we're ready for that second prong. And let's go back to our original slide. So we've kind of checked this one off. Now we're going to our second one, which is have a record of, of an impairment like this. So in the past, this person was met this definition, this person no longer does, thankfully they've gotten better, which is awesome news, but they feel like they are being discriminated against because of that history. So let's see prong two, what's required there. So again, people with a record are also protected. Um, so there's a stigma associated with it. So let's say somebody had a mental illness in the past. Well, the employer might be reluctant to hire that person. Or perhaps the person had cancer in the past. The employer might be concerned that the cancer will recur. It could be that the person is misclassified. Mis uh, the diagnosis was made at some point, but it ended up not being correct. Those types of things are going to protect this employee uh, because there's a, there appears to be a disability when, in fact, there isn't currently a disability. Now, this person is not entitled to reasonable accommodation because he or she is not disabled. So there's this, we're really looking at it from the standpoint of the prevention of discrimination and harassment, not the reasonable accommodation part of, of, of the protections under of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And now we're up to that third requirement. So this is being regarded as having an impairment. Again, this is subtly different than this one. So let's go to our third prong. The employer does not need to accommodate a regarded as employee because he or she is not disabled. So perceived is regarded as. Um, 
So here's an example of a regarded as. An employee with controlled high blood pressure um, is assigned, sorry, there's a typo there, is assigned to a less desirable job to the employer's incorrect belief that the new job would be safer for the employee. So the employer is, is in some sense trying to be a good employer. Hey, we want to keep this person healthy, so we're going to put them in a, a safer job, a better job for them. Unfortunately, it's not the job the employee wants. Maybe it doesn't involve as much pay or prestige or interesting work. That would be an example of regarding somebody as disabled who very possibly isn't disabled. A mildly depressed employee is reassigned to a less desirable job to the employer's unfounded fears that he might go psycho or maybe he'll kill himself or something. Again, a mildly depressed employee probably isn't disabled, but the employer is going overboard addressing an issue that doesn't need to be addressed in that way. As a result, it's usually a good idea to wait for the employee to come to you and saying, I need an accommodation. My blood pressure isn't being able to man it, being managed in this way, I need blah, 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 or I'm depressed, I need some assistance in this area. Certainly, if, um, if you want to approach the employee and say, hey, you know, this is an option, you can do that, but you ought to be also prepared for the employee saying, no thanks, don't need that now. Um, so perceived disabilities can be sensitive topics. There is no duty to accommodate a perceived disability. One uh, related to the perceived disability is when there are some physical signs of perhaps a disability. Uh, disfiguring scars is an example of that. The person may not have any impairment at all, but there's the concern or the identification this person has with a uh, disability. Let's consider a Lucy situation. Lucy was severely burned in a house fire when she was a child. She has significant scarring on her face, so it's visible to the general public. She applies to be a cashier and she's not hired, even though she's very qualified, because the employer is worried that customers will be uncomfortable with Lucy's scars. Under these circumstances, the employer is um, making a, a disparately treating Lucy uh, because of her dis her perceived disability and so therefore that would be a violation of the act. Lucy's not entitled to a reasonable accommodation because she's not in fact disabled but uh, she is entitled to not be treated as if she is disabled and not to be disadvantaged because of her disability. Now generally speaking the law does not protect people who are unattractive from discrimination. So let's say that Lucy wasn't burned in the fire. She's just not very attractive. She's got buck teeth. Um, she's got thin stringy hair. She's got a bump on her nose. Um, all of those not looking too attractive. The employer can perfectly lawfully say, Lucy, we're not hiring you because you're not as attractive as Larry or Sally or somebody else. I don't think that that's necessarily the best decision for the employer to make, but the employer could lawfully make that decision um, because the employer is not uh, perceiving Lucy as disabled, just perceiving Lucy as not as attractive as the other candidates. Okay, so we are up to our third uh, of our three. We, I said before that we have a three by three. Our first of our three by three. Our first one was wh what zones of the employment circumstance do we need to, uh, do employers need to uh, provide protection to employees? And we talked about pre-employment during the application process. We talked about during the employment relationship and we talked about with respect to fringe benefits. Then we talked about our second of our three prong was the three prong definition of disability. One is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity or major bodily function. We talked about a record of having a disability as our second prong, and we talked about being perceived as disabled as our third prong. So we've gotten through our first two of our three three-prong approaches. Now we're ready for our third. So we're getting, well, we're making good progress. The, the ADA protects people who are Defined as disabled under the act. So this is our, again, we need to have our three prongs here. So any of the three. 
with or without reasonable accommodation who can perform the essential functions of the job. So we're going to be loading up here with some important additional vocabulary. Um, so in order for the person, it's, it's not enough for the person merely to be disabled. For example, I might be in a coma somewhere. Clearly I'm disabled. I mean, I have substantial limitations in lots of functions, but there's no job I can do if I'm in a coma. And so guess what? The employer doesn't have any obligation to hire me into those circumstances. So knowing that a, a candidate is disabled doesn't mean, okay, now the employer has to do something. We have to look and see if the other two requirements of our three-prong approach actually are in effect. So you do need to know all three parts of this definition. Let's first of all examine this essential functions thing. I mean, how do you decide what is an essential function to a job? This is pretty tricky. I'm not going to lie to you. Imagine for a second that you want to hire a receptionist. Um, the receptionist is supposed to sit at the um, place where the doors to the public open. And let's say this is in a doctor's office. And this receptionist is supposed to greet patients give them some forms to fill out, record that they are present, and let the patients know when it's time for them to go back to an examining room. Let's say those are the duties. Uh, the receptionist in this particular office isn't responsible for answering the phones or for doing any type of filing work or typing, uh, things along those lines. So the function is just what I said. But um, once a week for lunch, the receptionist covers the phones while the telephone receptionist, which is a different position, is at break. Uh, maybe there's uh, four di or five different people who cover the phones. And so this receptionist, uh, who, who is the greeter receptionist, once a week is supposed to cover the phone for that hour. Now, I would argue that that second responsibility for the greeter receptionist is probably not an essential function. And so let's say that the, the, the uh, greeter receptionist has a hearing disorder that uh, makes it very difficult. She's an excellent lip reader, uh, so she has no trouble seeing people face to face and being able to communicate with them. But the telephone is really uh, something that she's not able to successfully use. So assuming that that once a week for an hour duty on the phone is a non-essential function, then uh, it is very possible to accommodate her in the essential function of her job, which is the greeter in the reception area function. But let's imagine a different uh, role. Let's say that um, this is an emergency room nurse. You know, um, in this particular emergency room staffs um, three nurses on a regular basis. Now, the emergency room doesn't know what emergencies are going to come into the emergency room in any particular day. There are some shifts where there's, you know, nothing more serious than somebody needing stitches um, and maybe having, you know, a fever and they need some ibuprofen. But sometimes there's really, really awful things. And suddenly there's five very ill people there, maybe gunshot wounds, maybe heart attack. Um, all kinds of problems can come up. And so all of the nurses have to be able to do all of the functions and they have to be able to do it fast. There's just not going to always be enough time to call people in maybe from other units and help them. To resolve those issues. And so in that situation, let's say that this particular nurse has a restriction. She can't lift more than 15 pounds. Well, if somebody is bleeding to death and they need to be lifted up onto the, car, onto the um, uh, gurney to be sent immediately down so that they can get a blood transfusion, they weigh more than 15 pounds. And it's just not possible to say, okay, well, we need to call Bob from you know, uh, the fifth floor to come down and help me lift this person up. No, this person's going to be dead before Bob gets down. And so in that situation, you would say an essential function would be that that nurse needs to be able to lift up that patient who comes in. That patient may weigh, you know, 150 pounds. Um, and so in that situation, the, the essential function might be quite a bit broader. 
And so the way, so you say, well, how does, how does the EOC or how does the court decide what an essential function is? This is where a smart and sophisticated employer can really make its life a lot easier. And that is the employer gets to largely decide, maybe decides who's wrong, but largely gets to um, frame the issue. Maybe we should say it like that. Um, it, its evaluation of what the essential functions of the job are is going to be given great weight by the court. So if the employer has uh, position descriptions, and many times there'll be a separate document called essential functions, whatever that employer says in that is going to be given great weight. Now, it's not the only game in town. I mean, an employer can't say, oh, we're going to be clever and we're going to really work this system and, and kind of engage in a bit of deception by saying things are essential functions when they're not. Uh, that's probably not going to work. But uh, things that are on the borderline, you certainly can decide, are we going to call this an essential function or are we not going to call this an essential function? Um, and so a good job description uh, is a, a useful tool in this process. Now, employers are divided about whether job or position descriptions are good ideas. Um, in a perfect world where you have you kind of an infinite number of sophisticated HR resources, job descriptions are probably a really good idea. But we don't live in a perfect world. And once you've created a document, and yet the working environment changes, but no one has gone back and changed the document, that's not a good place to be. Because the document says this is what Bob's supposed to be doing, but really that's not what Bob's doing. And you know what? People in Bob's position haven't been doing that since we changed the programming system or since we reconfigured the office or whatever. And so we really have outdated documents. And so that makes for a lot of confusion and it creates a messy situation from a litigation standpoint. So uh, you know, another thing is if you have a large uh, population or large uh, you know, mini units or many different supervisors, sometimes the same position will be used in very different ways. For example, you might have, going back to the, uh, the greeter receptionist, some, let's say this is a uh, multi-office uh, medical uh, company or met, I guess doctor's office scenario and in some of the offices the greet receptionist really just does greet the the patients gives them the form sends them back to the uh, 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 treatment rooms but then there are other offices where maybe they're a little bit slower um, where they actually have the greet receptionist do some filing and they actually have the greeter receptionist cover the phones significantly more than one hour a week but if you're using the same position description in all of those places, then how you define essential functions may not at all meet what you're seeing there. So it's a strategic question to think about what kind of job description or position description you're going to have, if any, and how you're going to keep that up to date. And especially in a larger organizations, how are you going to enforce or control or manage the fact that different managers are going to have their own spin on what needs to happen? Okay, so one thing that an employer doesn't have to do is it doesn't have to justify the speed of production or the quality standards that are needed for a particular job. What it does need to do, though, is it needs to enforce whatever standard it has. So if Bob, well, let's say the standard is 10 blanks an hour, whatever the job is. Bob's supposed to do 10 of these every hour, or and not just Bob, but everybody in this position. But, you know, Sally, she regularly does eight, and nobody seems to care too much that she's only doing eight. And uh, Teresa, she only does nine sometimes, and no one seems to be that worried about Teresa. But Bob, who's in a wheelchair, he drops to nine, and everybody's acting like it's the end of the world. Oh, my gosh, Bob's in a wheelchair. He can only do nine. We've got to fire him. Well, but if, if you can permit Teresa to only do nine, why can't you permit Bob to only do nine? So you can't selectively enforce a standard. You get to pick what the standard is, but then you need to be fairly ruthless about applying that standard. Now, can you, let's say you have the standard of 10. Let's say you are very consistent. Listen, anybody who falls below 10, they're going to get disciplined for it. Then Bob comes on board. He's in a wheelchair. Um, and um, 
you can decide. It would be fine if you were to say, listen, Bob, we're okay with you only doing eight. So the employer has the option of lowering production uh, levels. That's fine. What, what the employer can't do is hold Bob to a higher standard, either according to the written production rates or the actual practice in the facility. Otherwise qualified. Um, let's go back here to our terms here. actually don't have that term on our list, um, but that's part of the definition for disabled. The person is otherwise qualified. So let's see what we mean when we talk about otherwise qualified. Um, an employer may not, so a, what does otherwise qualified mean? Able to perform the essential functions of his or her position. I guess it has to do with the essential functions. So an employer may not consider the possibility that an employee may become disabled in the future. So let's say that um, I have a multiple sclerosis, which is oftentimes a progressive disorder. I may be able to do my job just fine now. I apply for another job. The employer might say, oh, as soon as we put Groover into this new job, maybe it's going to get worse. And then this job is more demanding than the old job. And maybe we don't want to go there. No, the employer needs to consider the employee in her or his current state without considering how the disease might progress. So let's consider this scenario. Mary works as a stock clerk. She's been shortlisted for promotion. During her promotional interview, she reveals that she's going to have some surgery and that if the surgery is successful, um, or even whether the surgery is successful or not, very likely she's not going to be able to have nearly as much movement. Um, in order to treat her condition. Um, in her new position, this merchandise manager job, she's going to have to travel frequently between uh, units to make sure everything is being displayed properly. Um, and it appears that when Mary has the surgery, she's going to become not otherwise qualified because she's not going to be able to go from one facility to the other because, again, she's going to uh, her movement is going to be severely limited, so it sounds like she's not going to be able to drive. But you know what? Today, she can do it. So we'll, we'll, we'll revisit it in 10 months when we know what her situation is. The employer can't say, well, you're going to be useless to us in 10 months, so we don't want to put you in the position. She can do the job today. We won't, the employer can't consider the 10 months issue. We'll talk about uh, this is a topic having to do with direct threat. So we'll, we'll save this one for when we get to the direct threat section. So to be qualified means to have the necessary skills, education, and experience for the job. And of course, related to that, under the otherwise qualified categories, the person can't be a direct threat to himself or herself. Um, now, direct threat sounds kind of ooh, dangerous, right? Um, and, and that can certainly come up. Somebody who has a psychiatric issue can be a direct threat if this person um, is, you know, uh, possibly uh, having some kind of a disorder that could result in them being violent. But most direct threats aren't of that type at all. So the, the name, I think, is a little bit misleading. Uh, let me give an example. Imagine that I have epilepsy. Well, if I am, uh, let's say the nature of my job requires that I climb ladders. And let's say that these ladders are very tall and so somebody is holding the ladder at the bottom. Well, if I have an epileptic seizure as I am high up, I fall, I could very seriously hurt myself, possibly kill myself, and I could land on that other person and severely injure that other person. And so you can see how I pose a threat, not because I want to pose a threat, but just because of the nature of the condition. Similarly, I could have some kind of communicable disease that um, possibly I could transmit to somebody else. Again, I don't want to transmit it, but possibly I could transmit it. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a direct threat situation. The issue of the level of risk that the disabled person poses to himself or herself 
or to others is often crucial to the determination of whether the applicant is otherwise qualified for the position. So, you know, it, it depends a, a matter of degrees. So, for example, let's say we have an HIV positive employee and we're not in the medical field. Well, the reality is that you don't exchange bodily fluids in the working environment. Let's say this is an office environment. So the odds of that HIV uh, blood this person has in his or her system affecting me, uh, his coworker, is very, very small. I mean, is it possible to imagine a scenario that could happen? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, somebody comes in and stabs Bob, the HIV positive employee, and then uses that same knife to stab me. And that knife on the blood that went through Bob at first has HIV positive blood and I get HIV. I mean, it could happen. It's super unlikely. Um, we would say that level of risk is very, very small. And under those circumstances, we would say there really is no direct threat. And so therefore, Bob would be otherwise qualified for the job despite his HIV diagnosis. So um, if a requirement for a position tends to screen out a person with a disability, the employer must be ready to prove that the requirement is job related and consistent with business, nece business necessity. Let's go back to the reading and writing test that was designed to test whether uh, Bob understood uh, the safety protocol to use um, with the conveyor belt. Um, Bob needed to know that to be a safe uh, conveyor belt worker. But he didn't need to know how to read and write to be successful at knowing that procedure. And the nature of the job doesn't require that Bob know how to read and write. Well, Bob has a severe dyslexia and really has a great deal of difficulty reading and writing, even though he knows very well how to handle the safety issues that come up. So you could see how a test, and the, and the, only, the only way that Bob can complete the test is by being able to successfully read and write this test, that it would be difficult for the employer to argue that uh, passing this written test is truly uh, an example of business necessity. Another example here is possession of a valid driver's license. Um, that would be a requirement for certain jobs. Let's say I'm a, um, I travel in business from location to location and there isn't the opportunity to use mass transit given where these locations are. Well, in that situation, a valid driver's license would be appropriate. But let's say that uh, the nature of my job, I could have someone drive me to work or I could use mass transit um, because many people who are disabled aren't able to have a driver's license because of a mobility issue. Maybe they're missing a limb or maybe their, their vision isn't um, okay or maybe they have epilepsy and therefore might have a seizure if they're behind the wheel of the car and therefore unable to have a license. Under those circumstances, the possession of a driver's license uh, may not be appropriate for that the particular position. Okay, so let's go back and think about, so we've kind of gone through the whole topic of essential functions. Or, and let's look here about, because we kind of covered this a little bit, but let me be a little bit more granular here. What is a definition of essential functions? Those tasks that are fundamental, meaning they're not marginal, they're not unnecessary, to the fulfillment of the position's objectives. And a good way of approaching this is to consider, would removing that particular function fundamentally change the job? Again, going back to the greeter receptionist. If we remove that one hour that she's on the phone during lunch, would the, would the job fundamentally change? I would argue no. But again, if we were to say to that nurse who has a 15 pound weight restriction, would the job fundamentally change if we allowed her not to lift anybody over 15 pounds. Well, there's lots of patients that come in that need that emergency procedure. She really wouldn't be able to satisfy that. So she really wouldn't be able to, in that urgent emergency situation, satisfy the needs. So I would say that that would be an essential function of the job. So when determining the essential function of the job, an employer must look at the means of performing that function, not on the function desired to be accomplished. So it could be there could be a variety of ways that the function would be performed. 
Uh, so for example, going back to the example of the greeter receptionist, let's say that the employer decides that that function for that hour really is essential. Well, there might be ways of buying amplification for the telephone or some other mechanism, maybe having a translator, uh, you know, uh, be able to translate what is being spoken through those uh, TDD uh, translation uh, for the phone systems that would allow the receptionist to function as a telephone receptionist. So the issue really isn't, um, is this person going to do it the typical or expected way, but it is really about, well, how will, can this person do it in some way, even though the way may look very different than the way we ordinarily expect it to look. Most jobs obviously do contain both essential and non-essential functions. So word processing, filing, and answering phones might well be essential for clerical jobs. But getting coffee, um, lifting boxes of copier paper, those probably aren't essential functions of the job. So again, we can only consider the essential functions. If a, a disabled person is not able to do the non-essential functions, then the employer cannot make a, a negative decision based upon the non-essential functions because those non-essential functions can be moved to an able-bodied person. Um, now obviously if, if the non-essential functions can be reasonably accommodated in such a way that the disabled person can perform them, then of course the disabled person can continue to do those non-essential functions. But non-essential functions that can't be reasonably accommodated can just be moved to somebody else and taken off of the disabled person's plate. Um, we already talked about the fact that the employer has a lot of leeway in defining what are the essential functions for a particular job. Ah, now we're up for direct threat. Direct threat is, is falls into that otherwise qualified category that we were just talking about. So what is a direct threat? A person who poses a direct threat to their own safety or health or to the safety and health of others. These could be coworkers, or these could be members of the general public is not qualified unless a threat can be eliminated by a reasonable accommodation. So example, you know, the epileptic employee's job requires climbing ladders. Um, that person can't be accommodated, but perhaps um, the, uh, the stuff that that epileptic employee is the reason that they're climbing the ladder, let's say they're getting boxes up from high to work on whatever's in there. Well, perhaps they could store the boxes on the ground level. And so eliminating the need for having the ladder at all. So it could be that by moving whatever, whatever the reason is that the ladder was necessary in the beginning with, uh, that we could move that to another place. It could also be that um, it's not an essential function for the epileptic employee to climb the ladder. I mean, it's just a, something that he has to do every now and again. Well, then again, if it's a non-essential function, just move it to another um, worker. An employee, employer can use the direct threat defense in the case of an employee with a disease only if the defense is based upon a reasonable medical judgment and an individualized assessment of the circumstances. Uh, this is important, especially with HIV, because there's been so much hype about that, that people start thinking, oh, I don't even want to be in the same room with somebody with that disease. Um, well, that's not a medical judgment. Uh, if a doctor says, given the particular requirements of this job, um, it's not safe for this person. This person poses a direct threat. That's when you have enough. That the, the person has a their coworker has a fear or phobia about it is not um, is sufficient to qualify it as a direct threat. If the disability claimed by an employee is based upon a disease, the court will determine whether the employee is otherwise qualified by assessing the level of risk the employee poses to himself or herself or to others. So again, it's not just that subjective belief. And again, the direct threat can be to coworkers, and it has to be a substantial, to third parties, customers, for example, or to the employee himself or herself. This is a, an important case. Does the ADA permit discrimination against those persons whose own health would be threatened by the conditions of the work? And the answer is yes. Uh, 
So remember here, we the, the way the statutory language reads, it's clear that coworkers are covered, it's clear that third parties are covered, but the wording of the language did not include the employee himself or herself. So we didn't get that clarity on the issue until we had this US Supreme Court case that said, yep, if the disease is dangerous to the worker himself or herself, then the employer um, can, d d won't, does not have to consider that person otherwise qualified. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about reasonable accommodation. Now we're going to talk about reasonable accommodation a hand in hand with undue hardship and then in our next lecture, we're going to talk in more detail about reasonable accommodation and undue hardship in terms of the, the approaches to the, how you, what the process actually looks like. But we're not gonna talk about the process during this section nearly so much. So what is reasonable accommodation? It's an accommodation that's reasonable, right? <laughs> that makes sense. Whenever we see the word reasonable in the law, please stop and think to yourself, objective standard this is so important objective standard this isn't what's in my mind because what i think is reasonable may be really different than what you think is reasonable so we're not using the standard of what you think is reasonable or what i think is reasonable we're kind of thinking about kind of an average over the whole society about what people think is reasonable so an accommodation to the individual's disability that does not place an undue burden or hardship upon the employer. An undue is kind of like reasonable. It's not just what one person thinks. I mean, honestly, most employers are going to think any bar burden's an undue burden, right? So really what a, a reasonable accommodation is focused on is removing unnecessary restrictions or barriers. Here's some examples. Uh, moving the disabled employee's workstation so it's closer to the stuff that he or she uses frequently. Let's say he or she has a mobility issue. It might involve uh, some new equipment um, that has special features. Maybe again, the bigger uh, monitor. Maybe a keyboard that has a different configuration. Um, uh, perhaps additional training so that the employee is able to use these new equipments. It could also involve um, uh, moving non-essential parts of the job to other people's plates. We talked about in the uh, religious uh, discrimination and accommodation section that the burden on the employer was de minimis. If it cost really any money, then the employer didn't have to do it. And the employer still could do it, but the employer was not legally required to do it. The standard on the, the ADA is significantly different. The employer is required to expend significant sums of money to reasonably accommodate. You may say, what's the difference? The language actually in the two statutes are identical. Um, I think the difference has to do with when the laws were passed. Keep in mind, Title VII was passed in 1964 and the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990. That's a lot of years. Lots of values in the society have changed and evolved. And so I think that's one of the big reasons that courts have approached this language in a different way because of different values in the culture. And so the uh, requirement under the ADA for reasonable accommodation is significantly more onerous for the employer. So don't assume that the religious accommodation requirements is similar to the disability accommodation requirements. Let's consider this scenario. Mary is a trained medical secretary at the hospital. She suffers from a condition that causes her to have periodic severe headaches that can last anywhere from a couple of hours to a few days. There's no cure for her condition and her pain is managed with medication that makes her drowsy. Normally without a headache, Mary is active and productive. Her request to work on a flex time basis is denied by the hospital because it would be impossible to prepare a schedule for her department without being sure whether or not she'll be able to be there. Under these circumstances, the hospital is not liable under the ADA because Mary's erratic, unexplained absences are not reasonable even if they are due to a disability. This is correct, but I caution you in this area. If Mary were member, if there were other people that were also medical secretaries um, that could sub in for Mary, um, we would probably have a very different answer here. This answer is good when Mary is the only person who can do this job. And so when Mary's out, things can't get done. But if there's another, if Bob is also a trained medical secretary in this department, the answer starts looking different. 
And certainly if there's more than Bob, then it starts looking like um, the employer can handle her erratic unexplained absences. Um, so this, this requires a little bit more uh, focus, I think, to get to the right answer. Okay, so the requirement of reasonable accommodation does not mean creating a new job. You don't have to make up a job for somebody. Um, um, for example, employers are not required to accommodate employees by lowering a production standard, although employers can. Uh, uh, but under the ADA, employers are permitted to accommodate by eliminating an essential function of the job or lowering a production standard. So employers can do more than what is legally required for the disabled person. Uh, the, the no one's going to come in and say, oh, you can't be nicer, but they're not required to. Also, a reasonable accommodation is not reducing the workload of the disabled person or providing the disabled person with more rights to his or her job than the non-disabled person. Now, I might pause here and say that, you know, a reasonable accommodation in some sense is more rights. So we're not talking about the reasonable accommodation analysis here. Also, um, creating a new job, we already said this, we don't need to create a new job if he, he or she's unable to perform the essential functions of the job. And we, we are, employers are also not required to provide personal use items, things that the employee would use outside of the work environment. For example, if the employee needs a hearing aid at work, she also needs it outside of work. If the employee needs a, a wheelchair at work, she probably needs it outside of work. And so if it's things that she would need outside of work, then the employer is not required to provide it. On the other hand, if the employee needs to have a, a large screen on her computer at work that it would be an example not of a personal use item because she's not taking that home with her at night and staying at work okay so that's what we need it that's what we mean when we're talking about reasonable accommodation let's contrast that with that undue hardship because as we said before in our definition we need to re we as an employer need to reasonably accommodate up until the point that it becomes an undue hardship that's the point what, you know, where we need to accommodate right up to this point, and then we don't have to cross the line into undue hardship. Undue hardship. It's established if the action would involve significant difficulty or expense in relationship to the size of the firm and its resources. So, what's an undue hardship for one company may not be one for another company. Um, it, the size of the company, the relative economic health of the company, those are factors that are going to affect it. If you're working for a large company, there really is no undue hardship argument, or at least it's going to be very, very unusual that you get to that point. So, if you're in, in a, a company with, you know, a few thousand employees, uh, don't even uh, don't even think in terms of expense being an undue hardship limitation. I would say though that significant difficulty, even when there's expenses in a factor, can become an issue. So, for example, let's say an employee is saying, "Well, um, I can't get to that part of the building." Well, it's going to involve you know a, a lot of hassle to remove everyone's workplace so that this employee can get to this particular area of the facility and it's going to involve maybe not a huge amount of expense but it's going to involve moving lots of people's offices and it's going to be very disruptive for the work environment. Uh, the expense wouldn't necessarily be the problem but just the uh, amount of upheaval that it causes that could be an undue hardship. It must be shown that the, ob the accommodation will impose a significant obligation on the part of the employer. And again, there's all kinds of, of ways that the employer can approach this. I showed you the, the JAN network. There's also grants and tax breaks that are available for reasonable accommodation efforts. So what are the things that can impact whether something is considered an undue hardship? Well, the financial difficulty, again, is especially helpful for smaller companies. Unduly costly, extensive, substantial, or disruptive. And then it might fundamentally alter the nature or operation of the business. When the cost of the accommodation would result in undue hardship and outside funding is not available, you should offer the disabled employee the option of paying a portion of the cost itself, himself or herself. Um, obviously, that's not something you're going to do if you're Exxon, but it's something you could do if you have, you know, 20 employees and you just can't afford the special van that this person would need to operate 
or uh, afford the the uh, the special accommodation need to, but maybe the employee is willing to do that. So again, this is going to be a fact-intensive, individualized consideration to decide when we cross over into the undue hardship territory. So a small employer may not be required to provide a specific reasonable accommodation for a disabled applicant, whereas a large employer within the same industry may be required to do so, simply because a larger employer has more assets. We're going to talk more about the reasonable accommodation process in our next lecture, but let's go through one scenario here. So Bob is a sales rep, and he is a very small company, obviously has more than 15 employees, but it's just he maybe has 16 and it supplies frozen foods to supermarkets. He's required to travel to the stores to meet their managers to view their inventory. After a recent road accident, Bob's left hand has become severely impaired and only his right hand is functional. Bob requests that the company install a one hand driving system. Unfortunately, that costs $35,000 to $45,000. Based upon the size and financial position of the company, this cost is more than it can afford. Now again, this one, you're, for the purpose of this question, we're assuming it's the case. But gosh, this is a tough one to make an assumption about. You shouldn't assumption. You need to have some legal guidance on this. The, the business person on its own should not just assume this. Um, this, this is a, a tricky issue. Um, it'd have to be a really small company that really is struggling for this to, to be too much. Arctic Fox should convey to Bob that it cannot make the requested accommodation due to undue hardship, but see if there's another open option for which Bob could be qualified. It also should give Bob the option of, of paying for some or all of it himself I mean, for so that he can stay in the job. Here's another scenario. Bob is a nurse at a private hospital. He te tests HIV positive during one of the re regular screenings that they do in the hospital. Whenever an employee whose job requires him to have direct contact with patients tests positive for a bloodborne disease, the hospital shifts him or her to a desk job with no change in his salary. But Bob refuses this arrangement. He instead requests that the hospital hire a part-time nurse to follow him on his shift to keep track of him to make sure he doesn't do anything that could expose patients to the bloodborne pathogen. The hospital denies his request and fires Bob because of his unwilling, unwillingness to move to the desk job. Given the very special nature of Bob's job, Bob's request can be lawfully denied as it represents an undue hardship for the hospital. But, you know, because, you know, Bob is obviously, um, you know, giving injections, dealing with um, uh, open wounds in, in the patient and things like that. He's dealing with, with blood and, and things like that. It's really just that very unusual nature of the job that he is able, that it is, is possible for the hospital to exclude him from the job based upon his HIV tests. The vast, vast majority of jobs in the United States don't involve any type of situation where an HIV person would be exposing coworkers or others to the HIV. And so under those circumstances, this just very unusual factual situation does allow the hospital to say no. Again, for the vast majority of jobs, HIV status would not affect the employee's ability to do his or her job, would not be an undue hardship, the worker would not pose a direct threat. So we've covered introduction, the prima facie case, and some key ADA concepts in this lecture. In our second lecture, we will discuss in more detail the uh, a reasonable accommodation process. We'll discuss some special categories of disabilities. We'll discuss the remedies that are available to successful plaintiffs under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we'll discuss some special topics, some of which I've kind of touched on a little bit, but we'll do a little bit deeper dive into hiring, harassment, contingent workers, the topic of retaliation, workers' compensation, genetics, and also leave issues. I thank you for your attention. I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, presentation, that you found value in it. As always, if you have questions, don't hesitate to call, I mean, call me or to send me an email at cgroover at colin.edu. Or better yet, come by my office hours so we can talk in more detail. I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks again. Bye-bye.